I am thrilled and honored to introduce Dr. Henry Pollack, whose book, A World Without Ice, was a revelation for me at a critical point in the organization of Vanishing Ice. I had the vision of how art fit into the picture, but the science of ice was always just a little fuzzy. After reading Dr. Pollock's book, A Fundamental Guide to Everything You Need to Know About Ice, concepts suddenly crystallized. His accessible and engaging prose inspired me to incorporate several seminal quotes into the exhibition and catalog. An influential educator, Dr. Pollock is also very generous. He has taken the time to come to Bellingham a week before a major trip to Antarctica. Dr. Pollock is Professor Emeritus of Geophysics in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Michigan. His recent research has focused on climate change as recorded by the temperatures in the rocks beneath the Earth's surface. Currently, he is studying the effects of climate change on the Great Lakes of North America. Dr. Pollock has served on many advisory panels for the National Science Foundation and National Research Council, testified before National Academy of Science and US Senate committees, and provided briefings about climate change to Congress and the White House. He has published widely in scientific journals, was a contributing author to the Nobel Prize winning Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report, and is a scientific advisor to former Vice President Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. <laughs> in 2003, Dr. P Pollock authored Uncertain Science, Uncertain World, aimed at a non-scientific audience where, the, where he discusses scientific uncertainty and the role it plays in the formulation of public policy. Here, he guides readers through the debate over global climate change, showing how scientists work and make progress in an environment of uncertainty. In A World Without Ice, the second book written for the public at large in 2009, Dr. Pollock describes the role of ice in shaping Earth's landscape and climate. He also examines the likely fate of the cryosphere in the face of continued human-produced warming. Given all of Dr. Pollock's accomplishments, I was not sure if he would even accept an invitation to lecture in conjunction with Vanishing Ice. One of my colleagues encouraged me, why don't you ask? I googled Henry Pollock and up popped his University of Michigan webpage with his email address. I posed the question, and here we are. What a privilege to host him here today. Please join me in welcoming Henry Pollock to Bellingham. Thank you, Barbara. It's a real treat to be here in Bellingham, uh, part of the country that I've not had the pleasure of visiting uh, earlier. And uh, I realized that the, the visit is much too short and that I have to come back uh, and really enjoy uh, the North Cascade region. So thanks for the introduction that uh, has given me this first taste. Now, I want to actually start out with special thanks to Barbara. That's the Mutual Admiration Society here. Uh, thanks to Barbara for her, her vision and perseverance in assembling this wonderful, ambitious exhibit. Uh, it's not an easy topic to talk about Earth's changing climate and tell the story uh, through the prism of ice but she has done a wonderful job doing it, and I hope all of you have had a chance to see uh, the exhibit. I also want to thank Chris Brewer for organizing uh, the accompanying educational programs, and of course, thanks to all the sponsors. I know you've heard uh, some of them mentioned already, uh, the North Cascade Institute, Western Washington University, 
uh, Whatcom County, the city of Bellingham, and many, many others. And so thanks again to the sponsors that have enabled this uh, to happen. We'll see if I can master the technology here. It seemed like I failed on my first uh, effort, but we'll try again. That works. All right. Uh, my talk today is really about ice and water. Uh, the, the two make up the solid and liquid phases of this wonderful compound we call H2O. And uh, the interplay between ice and water is modulated by the Earth's climate. And when the climate chills down, uh, we find that ice grows. When the climate warms up, we find that water grows at the expense of ice. And it's a, uh, so this, it's a story that I'm going to uh, relay to you about the, the changes, the balance, uh, changes in the balance between ice and water that we've had uh, on the planet for several thousand years uh, and how that is beginning to change under uh, Earth's warming climate. Now the, this is the only commercial um, as Barbara mentioned, uh, I uh, published this book, A World Without Ice, which is uh, the story of climate change as uh, shown uh, through the medium of ice. And it's a good read. <laughs> uh, it's done well uh, in, the, in the various competitions. Uh, I'm particularly proud that the uh, Royal Society in London uh, shortlisted it for their uh, science prize books in 2010. But I'm equally proud of the, the third uh, citation here, where the city of Bellingham's public library has selected it for their Bellingham Reads program in February. So for those of you who uh, either pick a book up or just want to go and uh, hear the discussion, uh, I'm sure that's going to be a lively uh, uh, venue for discussing this topic again. Now, I want to uh, say just a little bit of the framework of the book before continuing with the lecture. The book offers an, an historical perspective of ice and people uh, over a time frame uh, that begins at the peak of the last ice age around uh, 20,000 years ago, at a time when there was a lot of ice and very few people. And it progresses up to the present day when there's much less ice and a great many more people. And it then takes a look into the future. And of course, we don't know exactly how the future is going to unfold, but uh, it could lead to uh, a world without ice, which is the title of the book. All right, with that as background, let me uh, begin this tour. Uh, I don't want that. What did I do there? Well, let's, let's try this. All right, someone has to help here. There's too many buttons on the machine. Here comes Chris. <laughs> you can fix that. Great. Okay. Uh, okay. I just wanted to advance. Great. That one, yes, I, I had the you proper. Had that one. I'm sure you I, I did. had the proper instructions. <laughs> I just pressed the wrong button. Okay. Sorry. This, this is a uh, an illustration uh, where the the little blue marble shows the amount of H two O on Earth compared to the whole volume of the Earth, and you can see that uh, the the volume of H two O is uh, not a big part of the Earth's total composition. But it's an important part uh, because, of course, uh, we, we need it for our uh, livelihood, and it plays a very important role in, in the climate of the Earth as well. Now, H2O resides in a number of places on the planet, uh, and I've listed them here in order of uh, decreasing importance. And the obvious place, of course, where most of the H2O resides is in the oceans, and that has about 96% of all uh, the H2O on the planet. 
But the next most important component is ice and snow, which uh, is about 3%. And uh, the groundwater, the water beneath the surface, is another percent. And then everything else, including all the lakes and rivers of the earth, uh, all the water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, all the water in the biosphere, all that adds up to less than, than 1%. So if we uh, take a look at uh, where on earth these different uh, uh, components of uh, H2O reside, uh, the oceans, of course, are the big one. And I show this picture of the Atlantic Ocean uh, and just to emphasize the point that there's more water in the oceans than actually the bathtub will hold. And the water sloshes up onto the continents. So if you look at the eastern margin of North America, the continental margin is right here, and the water has progressed inward over what we call the continental shelf. And so there's uh, a little more water in the oceans than the ocean, deep ocean basins can hold, and so it's lapped up uh, onto the continents. Now the locations of the ice are well known also, uh, largely in Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, there's a, a relatively small amount of ice on tops of mountains, and of course you see some of it uh, right here in the Pacific Northwest. But uh, of the big ice on Earth, uh, about three quarters of it sits on what we call East Antarctica, the, the high polar plateau where ice is uh, more than 10,000 uh, feet thick. And uh, the remaining one quarter is split about equally between West Antarctica and uh, the ice cap on Greenland. And so uh, the, this essentially has uh, the big, uh, the, what we call the big ice. Now, as far as surface waters go, uh, even though they make up less than 1% of the H2O on Earth, 20% uh, of the surface water sits right here in North America also in the Great Lakes, uh, shared between Canada and the USA. And the, uh, the theme that I mentioned earlier about uh, the way in which climate uh, makes transfers from one of these uh, reservoirs of H2O to another. For instance, when the, the climate cools, uh, then you find oceans lose water uh, because it is temporarily trapped as ice on continents during an ice age. And uh, if the climate warms, uh, ice uh, in the polar regions or on tops of mountains uh, melts and runs back to the oceans eventually and so the oceans grow. Now, all of that translates into changes in sea level as the amount of water in the oceans uh, is responding to climate change. So at the peak of the last ice age, when the oceans lost water to the ice that settled on the continents for a while, sea level was about uh, 400 feet lower at the peak of the last ice age. And it was during that time when sea level was lower that some of the big migrations of humans uh, moved from Asia across the Bering Land Bridge, which was exposed because of low sea level, and uh, populated uh, North and South America. That was an event that uh, took place only 15,000 years ago. The other uh, extreme is if we would lose all the ice today, what would happen? And that would flow back into the oceans and it would raise sea level about 250 feet. And as you can imagine, a rise in sea level of 250 feet has big consequences. Now, if we take a look at a map of what these extremes look like, uh, on the one hand, the coastline during the peak of the last ice age when sea level was much lower, this would have been the eastern margin of uh, North America. Just for orientation, here's New York and Long Island, New Jersey, city of Philadelphia, Washington DC, and so forth. 
So this is where the coastline was at the peak of the last ice age. The other extreme is if we lose all of our ice today, that we have today uh, in Greenland and Antarctica, then sea level would rise to the green line. And you can see that it doesn't treat coastal cities kindly. And they're not just US coastal cities, it's coastal cities all around the world. So there is the potential for a considerable interruption of our, of our lives, our coastal infrastructure, uh, and the like. Well, I want to start out uh, taking a look at what things were like in the last ice age, uh, and when the sea level was much lower, where was the ice? Uh, this is what it looked like for North America. Uh, there'd be similar maps for Europe and Asia, but uh, ice spread from uh, roughly a center in Hudson Bay. Uh, it spread laterally and uh, in all directions. And uh, with a big lobe coming uh, into the northern Midwest of the USA and uh, giving rise to uh, a terrain underneath it as the ice spread, ice turns out to be a, a huge uh, carver of landscape. It's a you know, very, very capable at eroding rock, and it, uh, it gave us some of our most spectacular uh, landscapes around the globe. Now I'm going to give you a test here. Uh, this is a satellite photograph, and I'm only going to give you one hint as to where it is. That is that this is Lake Ontario. And so what are we looking at here? the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. And these are deep gouges uh, into the bedrock of New York State that if in fact they reached the sea, we would call them fjords. And in places of course where the glacial ice did reach the sea, uh, following and carving deep valleys, they did create fjords, such as uh, this from Norway, but it's a view that it uh, could have been from Greenland or New Zealand uh, or uh, Chilean Patagonia, all of which were glaciated during the last ice age and uh, spectacular topography. Now, uh, we also, in, in high mountainous areas, uh, see the effects of uh, glacial erosion. Uh, in the uh, Sierra, this is the Yosemite Valley, and this deep U-shaped valley, which we now recognize as a glacially carved valley, uh, that's all done through glacial erosion when that was filled with a huge glacier uh, up at the high elevations of the Sierra. The, this is the Torres del Paine National Park in Chile, an equally spectacular terrain that was carved by, by glacial ice. And here on, in Baffin Island in the Canadian Arctic, another spectacularly uh, deep valley and, and many others like it uh, carved uh, by the glacial ice. So the ice was very busy uh, giving us the landscape that we admire so much today. Uh, what, were, what about the people on the planet uh, at the time of the last ice age? Well, altogether, there were probably a million people over the entire globe uh, 20,000 years ago. Uh, a million people is about one quarter of the uh, today's population of the greater Seattle area. And so if you could imagine only one quarter of the people in your neighborhood uh, spread over the entire world, you'd, you'd see what a low, low population density uh, was like only 20,000 years ago. Well, things are very different today. Uh, today, there's a lot less ice than there was during the last ice age, and there are a lot more people. And the people at the last ice age were busy just feeding themselves. Uh, they, that was the main undertaking, uh, was to uh, be able to survive, and it was not an easy, easy life for them. But as I said, today there are many more people. Uh, Earth, 20,000 years ago with one million people, by, 19, or by 1800, there was already one billion people on Earth. And by 1930, 
there were two billion people. And by 1975, there were four billion people. And by 2012, just uh, a little more than a year ago, seven billion, and in the uh, next decade, we'll be reaching eight billion. The good news is that the population uh, growth has slowed, and the predictions uh, of mid-century population uh, about nine billion, and then perhaps even a slight decline after that point. So there's a lot more people on Earth, and they've grown very, very capable. Just as ice was a prodigious eroder during the last ice age, today people are equally strong in, in their own way. Uh, today people move more earth with our big machines than rivers do. People have changed the chemistry of the atmosphere. They have changed the chemistry of the oceans. And uh, these are all having effects. Now, not only have there, are there more people, but they are using much more energy in going about the workaday uh, activities that humans uh, have undertaken. And one of the, the outputs of this is that by burning fossil fuels, the coal, petroleum, natural gas, uh, the byproduct of that is the uh, production of carbon dioxide. And this is a graph from the middle of the 19th century uh, up through the 20th century and then in the present day. And after about the end of World War II, there was a tremendous growth in the amount of uh, energy consumption and accordingly a tremendous growth in the uh, growth of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is a heat-trapping gas. It, it prevents heat from escaping from Earth back to space. And so this has led to the warming of our surface and our atmosphere. This is a graph of the average temperature of the Earth since the late 19th century. And it's, the reference point is uh, the average temperature between 1950 and 1980, shown by this red line, that's the zero on this graph. It's just the average temperature in that interval, and anything uh, on the top side of it means it's warmer than that, and below it, uh, it's cooler. But what you can see, you don't need to be a, a climate scientist to see this, is that the general trend is upward, and that's what we're, here called global warming. The average temperature for the Earth has been, has been warming. Now, I sometimes hear criticisms of the scientists who uh, measure temperatures and uh, you know, operate weather stations and the like, and there are people who speculate that there are inaccuracies or other deficiencies in the data. And I like to point out that we don't have to use instruments to determine the fact that our climate is changing. That in fact, nature has her own thermometers. And uh, in my perspective, uh, nature's best thermometer is ice. And here I'm gonna ask you just to pause and read this because I think that ice is a, a totally neutral observer of climate change. Ice doesn't have a position. Ice doesn't uh, engage in discussions about climate change. Ice just responds to it. And when it gets warm enough, ice melts. And in the current uh, in recent past decades, uh, ice has been melting everywhere around the globe. And again, I, for those who've seen the exhibit, uh, you, you know what a wonderful collection there is that's showing you before and after or early and later photos that illustrate this. Uh, be sure and have an opportunity to see it. I'll show you a few here. Uh, in the tropics, the ice is only on tops of high mountains. Uh, in the Andes of Bolivia or in equatorial Africa on Kilimanjaro. But in 1940, a small glacier sitting here in Chacotaya in Bolivia occupied this area. By 2007, just a scrap left. 
Uh, Kilimanjaro, the home of the famous snows of Ernest Hemingway's uh, snows of Kilimanjaro, uh, 1970. This is the approximate outline of snow and ice. Uh, in 2008, uh, there's almost nothing left. Uh, I'm sure that some of you have hiked in, in Kilimanjaro and have seen the ice in earlier days. Uh, it's late uh, for that endeavor. In the Alps of Europe, the Rhone Glacier, uh, one that has uh, been extensively photographed, uh, indeed, uh, an artistic rendition of the Rhone Glacier in 1850. Uh, the glacier passes through an upland valley, down a steep slope, spreads out into a big lobe in the lower valley. That's what it looked like in 1850. By 1927, the, the tongue coming down the slope is still there, the upper valley is still filled, but the lobe down below is gone. By 1981, the tongue is now gone, but the upland valley is still full. And recently, the upland valley is gone as well. This is characteristic of nearly all the alpine glaciers uh, and, and glaciers elsewhere. Uh, our own Glacier National Park established in 1910. Uh, there were more than 100 glaciers in Glacier National Park when it was established. Uh, today, there are only about 20, and at the rate they are being lost, uh, there won't be any by mid-century. Uh, when our grandchildren will say, you know, Daddy, Grandpa, why did they name that place Glacial, Glacier National Park? You'll have to tell them that it used to have ice. Even right here in ter terrain that's very familiar to you, uh, the Boulder Glacier on Mount Baker, in 1985 down to about here. In 2003, uh, there's much, much less of it. Uh, of the uh, remaining uh, Cascade glaciers, uh, they've thinned by about uh, 30 feet from their original thickness. Uh, since 1960, uh, they've lost about 80% of their volume, and four have disappeared entirely. And so the very trends in Glacier National Park are, are uh, appearing here in the North Cascades as well. This is in Glacier Bay National Park. That's uh, probably a popular trip from uh, this area. Uh, this is just one of the many glaciers in Glacier Bay. I think it's the McBride Glacier. Uh, this is a picture from uh, about uh, 1995 or so. But in 1966, the glacier was all the way out here. The, the, the sediment bar is the end moraine of the glacier in 1966, and it's receded about two kilometers back. In the Beagle Channel in southern Chile, uh, we, uh, you can see this big uh, bare rock region and the ice up above. Uh, this has all been lost, the area that was covered here, and how do we know it was covered? Well, Charles Darwin, when he, in 1835, was going through the channel in this ship, the Beagle, for which the channel was named, uh, his diaries tell about ice uh, glaciers tumbling down from the, from the upland and discharging icebergs into the Beagle Channel, and it was a navigational hazard uh, as they were trying to pass through. So that was in 1835, and, and uh, today, uh, you barely can see the ice. Now, in Antarctica, on the Antarctic Peninsula, and we'll have a look at some of this later, uh, there, uh, there are hundreds of glaciers, 90% of them are retreating. So it's truly a, a worldwide uh, phenomenon. In Asia, in the Tibetan Plateau and, and Himalaya Mountain region, uh, that's sometimes called the third pole because there's a tremendous amount of ice in the uh, upland region there. And one of the uh, scenes that you will see in the exhibit uh, is this comparison photo of the West Rong Rongbuk Glacier uh, in 1921 and a photo taken in 2009 from exactly the same position and you can see that most of the ice in this lower valley is now gone. Uh, the rest of it is uh, changing, 
But right here at the arrow, which doesn't appear in Barbara's more elegant display, uh, but I put the arrow on, uh, in, 2000, uh, in 1921, it was, you can see the edge right there. That same point here uh, shows the thinning of the ice. And this glacier has thinned 100 meters, or more than 300 feet, in just a century. So it's not just the, the area that the glacier occupies, but there's thinning that's taking place uh, of the glacial ice. So what do these changes matter? One of the sub-themes of the exhibit is that ice matters. And what do these changes amount to in terms of, are there anything that's really important aside from the visual aspects? And the answer is most certainly yes. And in particular, in Asia, with the changes that are taking place in the, in the Tibetan Plateau and Himalayas, uh, it's affecting uh, all of the major rivers of Asia that have their headwaters in the upland regions. Uh, the Indus River, uh, the Ganges, uh, the Yellow River flowing uh, east uh, through China, uh, the Yangtze River, the Mekong, all of these rivers provide the agricultural, the municipal, and the domestic water for about a third of Earth's population. And while the glacial ice is there, that water supply will not be interrupted. But once the, the glacial ice is gone, about half the base flow of these rivers disappears. And so there's major implications uh, about ice really mattering uh, in terms of just water supplies around the world. Uh, in the American West, that same Characteristics are happening uh, as you lose glacial ice from the North Cascades and from Glacier National Park. There's lots of demands on the water that comes from uh, these regions. There are agricultural demands, there's hydropower demands, there's ecological services that the water provides, there uh, is recreational demands, and they all want the water to be coming at certain times of the year and with climate change, everything is shifting in time and sometimes in volume as well. And so the, what has been a steady uh, water supply uh, for large regions of the globe uh, is becoming very unsteady. Now, global warming is not uniform over the entire globe. Uh, only in places like Wo Lake Wobegon, where everyone's above average, uh, do, you, do you find these, uh, these uh, aberrancies. But in fact, global warming, uh, there are places on the Earth that uh, are warming the average. There are some that are warming more than average, some below average, and some few places are actually cooling. But the, if you look at the places where the warming is really taking off, it's in the northern high latitudes. And there, the warming is twice as great as the world, world average. And so the Arctic is a place where uh, one is seeing dramatic changes uh, year by year. Another place that is, has undergone very strong warming is the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, we heard a little bit uh, from Eric Steig yesterday in one of the presentations associated with the exhibit about the uh, accelerations of the Pine Island Glacier, and I'll come back to take a look at that in a little bit also. But I want to talk about what's going on in the, in the Arctic uh, right now. Here's a, a picture of uh, the Arctic uh, published by NASA, and this is from the end of the summer in 1979. And at the end of the summer, you can see there is still a lot of, uh, of the Arctic Ocean that is frozen. This is sea ice. And there's, of course, a big pile of ice sitting on Greenland. And uh, just by mentioning, uh, in the historic search for a Northwest Passage from Europe to the Pacific across the Arctic, uh, all the, the searching took place in, through the Canadian Arctic Islands. And you can see even in 1979, there was no way to get through 
the Northwest Passage was blocked by ice as it had been uh, for a very long time. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Now, what happens in the Arctic, there's a seasonal fluctuation uh, in the sea ice. Uh, in the winter, sea ice grows in area. So this is a, a looking down at the uh, Arctic at the end of the winter. This would be in April, say. Here's the North Pole. And the entire Arctic Ocean uh, is frozen. There's sea ice along the coast of Greenland. Hudson's Bay is frozen. Comes down along uh, the Canadian shore here. Spills out through the Bering Strait, down uh, south of Kamchatka. Very extensive freezing of the ocean uh, in uh, the Arctic winter. But in the summertime, it shrinks back, uh, partly through melting, partly through uh, uh, breaking up of the sea ice and, and sending it out into the ocean where it eventually melts. So that at the end of the summer, it's a much smaller area. Here's a picture of it in 2009. But the average, this pink line here, is what the average of the summertime sea ice uh, averaged over 1979 to 2000. But we are seeing a, a decline in summertime sea ice. Let me just show you a picture of what sea ice looks like uh, compared to uh, bigger ice from the continents. Sea ice is just frozen seawater. Uh, from this vantage, it looks like a thin sheet. It's actually uh, about uh, three to four feet thick. You could drive on it uh, if you could get a vehicle there. But uh, this breaks up. Here you can see sea ice in the process of breaking up. And the, the sea ice at the end of the summer in the Arctic has been on a decline since 1979. Uh, and it's a very dramatic decline. This is a, a graph uh, from 1979 when uh, the sea ice was on the order of seven and a half uh, million square kilometers. Uh, but even though there's year to year variability, no doubt that it's not a, a straight line uh, behavior. Nevertheless, again, I didn't need to draw that blue line for you to see the general trend. Uh, it's downward. And the, at the rate at which the sea ice is declining in area, uh, if that continues, we'll have an ice-free Arctic Ocean in the summertime before mid-century. And that will have uh, really big uh, consequences. Now, I mentioned the Northwest Passage. Uh, in 2012, when it was an all-time low, uh, I had the uh, opportunity to transit the Northwest Passage uh, from Alaska through the Canadian Arctic Islands and on to Greenland. This is the route in reverse that Roald Amundsen uh, traversed uh, in the early part of the 20th century when it took him three years between 1903 and 1906 to do that route uh, through the Northwest Passage. When I did it in 2012, it took us three weeks because there was no ice. We didn't have a better ship. We didn't have any superior technology. We just had a clear path. And the, the Arctic was open for the Northwest Passage. Now, the region around the Arctic, of course, is not just the sea ice that is changing, but the entire region. And uh, there's a region around the Arctic that is uh, a region of permafrost. This is regions where the annual temperature uh, stays below the, the freezing point. Uh, the average annual temperature stays below the freezing point. And everything shown in purple is this region of, of permafrost, a very big extent. But the warming of uh, the atmosphere in the Arctic uh, is having its effect. Uh, here's just, this is the, uh, the daily low temperature averaged over the entire year, uh, shown plotted year by year. And what it really shows is that it's not getting as cold as it used to. And that usually means that the nights, the nights are, are warmer than, uh, than they used to be. 
And the fact that it's not getting as cold has a consequence. And it's in an odd statistic. In the Arctic, ironically, it's easier to travel in winter when everything is frozen. You can drive across the tundra and uh, you, you don't get bogged down in the soft, soft summer uh, upper few uh, feet that softens up over the summer. So they have something called tundra travel days when you can safely go across the tundra with a vehicle. And it used to be in the uh, 1970s that it would freeze up in November and stay frozen up until uh, mid-May. And so you would have this period of time, uh, several months where you could drive across the tundra. Well, you can see that slowly the freezing up is happening later and later. And in the last few years, <clears throat> it doesn't uh, freeze up until uh, late January, early February, and it lasts uh, three months and then it's soft again. So this is just a simple indicator of the, the climate change effect uh, in the Arctic. Now, Greenland is a big pile of ice in the Arctic. Uh, in the center of uh, Greenland, it's uh, also uh, on the order of 10,000 feet thick uh, ice. Uh, the people who drill ice cores, such as the talk by Eric Steig yesterday, uh, have drilled th through this entire column and have been able to reconstruct the climate uh, that Greenland has experienced uh, over, uh, actually over several tens of thousands of years. Now, 2012, this unusual year when the sea ice was at its minimum, uh, the other aspects have been changing on Greenland as well. And here, we, we see a depiction of Greenland with some colors superimposed on it. Every summer, when the northern hemisphere warms up, there is some melting that takes place on Greenland. It's usually in the southern part of Greenland, and it's at low elevations near sea level. But uh, over the years, the, the summertime melting has extended all the way around Greenland, and has been climbing higher and higher uh, and, and, and uh, affecting greater areas of, of the Greenland ice cap. Now, I mentioned the summer of 2012, a year ago. In that summer, all of Greenland was melting, even at 10,000 feet elevation. Uh, there was uh, summertime melting taking place. And it leads to the accumulation of meltwater lakes on the top of the Greenland ice cap and uh, meltwater plummeting down fissures and crevasses uh, and going all the way to the base of the Greenland ice sheet and lubricating the base of it. And it's leading to a, a, an acceleration of the loss of ice from the Greenland ice sheet through the various fjords that are uh, like toothpaste tubes where you have a big reservoir of toothpaste and a small outlet through the, the mouth of the tube. Uh, that's how glacial ice leaves Greenland. And one of the, the major glaciers is the Jakobshavn Glacier, here shown from uh, a space shuttle picture. This is the Greenland ice sheet. This is exposed rock on the coast of Greenland. And the Jakobshavn Glacier, uh, the blue line there is the front of the glacier around 2003. The rest of the fjord is just full of ice that's broken off from the glacier and is flowing out to sea. A closer look at that, uh, here's a, uh, an air, air, aircraft view. This is uh, about oh, six miles across. Uh, here's the front of the, of the glacier. And then all this debris that has broken off and is moving down uh, the channel. Closer to the sea, this is the fjord, the uh, Jakobshavn fjord. And it looks like it's all ice, but of course there's a fishing boat that's making its way up through the water. This is actually floating ice. And a World Heritage Site 
uh, at uh, Jakobshaven, uh, shown here, uh, where one can see the debris, the big pieces of Greenland heading out to sea. So does all this action in the Arctic really matter? Uh, should we care about it? Well, the opening of the Arctic Ocean in the summertime uh, is an open invitation for resource exploration and exploitation. Uh, not only uh, uh, energy resources, uh, petroleum and natural gas, uh, but also the fisheries resource uh, that has been inaccessible because of the ice. And so there's an increase of activity uh, in the Arctic in both of those categories uh, right now. There are geopolitical tensions as to who actually owns territory in the Arctic. No one really cared when you couldn't do anything with it, but when, when uh, it turns out that there are, there are resources, uh, there are now questions of who, who owns territory in the Arctic. And uh, while the continental shelf is pretty well defined, uh, the open ocean is still a little bit of a, a debate. And it's governed by what is called the law of the sea, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. But the United States has chosen not to ratify that treaty for reasons totally uh, undecipherable. Every Secretary of State since uh, President Eisenhower has urged the Senate to ratify the treaty, and it never has. So, uh, and there are people that live in the Arctic. Uh, there's an indigenous population. Some four million people live north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, unlike the Antarctic, where there's no indigenous populations, the Arctic has a, a lot of people who have there and their ancestors lived there for thousands of years and they're being uh, affected as well. Well, on to the really big ice, uh, to the Antarctic. Here's a satellite a mosaic of the Antarctic. And as you can see, most of it is covered with ice. There's a little bit of rock that sticks out in the Transantarctic Mountains, which run across here. And at scales you probably can't even see along the coastline, uh, there is uh, rock that's exposed. Now, the Antarctic is different than the Arctic because while the Arctic is an ocean that's surrounded by a continent, the Antarctic is a continent that's surrounded by an ocean. And the ocean in the Antarctic circles the continent in a current that's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it just goes round and round, driven by the westerly winds. And so if we take a close look, uh, this is at the inset here, here's the continent and the circumpolar current goes right around and uh, in a never ending loop around the continent. And the Antarctic Peninsula, which is this little uh, uh, protrusion up towards South America shown here, uh, is that's the narrowest part of the passage around. That's the, the famous Drake Passage where the weather's terrible and it's hard to round the horn and things like that. Uh, but the circumpolar current that's coming along here, uh, the, these waters are warming. And as a result, you're bringing a warm water uh, impinging on the western side of uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, and it's having very dramatic uh, changes as, as well. There are uh, some Scientific stations here, here's Palmer Station, which is a USA station. Uh, a little further to the south is uh, the Vernadsky Station, run by the Ukraines now, formerly Faraday Station, run by the British, but the British sold it to Ukraine. And there the evidence of temperature change of warming is very strong, uh, particularly in the winter. Uh, the winter air temperature has been climbing uh, Vernadsky is the long record in black, Palmer is the shorter record in red, but they reconfirm each other. Uh, the, the amount of warming uh, is on the order of a degree Celsius per decade uh, in the, in the wintertime. Uh, averaged over the summer, uh, still it's a very rapid rate of warming. If one looks at it on a, a larger scale, uh, here's a, a picture of the temperatures of both the oceans and some on the ice as well. 
but you can see that all along West Antarctica and along the Antarctic Peninsula, there has been this warming that is documented uh, in the weather stations on the peninsula itself. Uh, the effect this, is, this has had on the sea ice in the Antarctic is shown here. Uh, on the West Antarctic Peninsula, uh, where the, the circumpolar current impinges directly, again, there's lots of ups, ups and downs. There's, there's a lot of climate variability year to year, but again, the general trend is down. And in the 30 years, uh, or 25 years shown on this graph, uh, the area of wintertime sea ice has been reduced by 30%, and the duration of the sea ice is almost uh, three months shorter. Now, this has had an effect. I'm not going to uh, dwell on it, but it's had a big effect on the penguin populations and, and the seal populations. Uh, some penguin populations like sea ice, others don't, and so there's been a, a shift in uh, populations as the warming has eliminated the sea ice. So another phenomenon that's taking place in the Antarctic, uh, as I said, this, this is a huge pile of ice here, and the glaciers that, that deliver this ice to the sea, uh, in, in this direction they flow across the Transantarctic Mountains, which are here, and spill out onto the ocean to create the Ross Ice Shelf. This is floating ice on the ocean, and in this direction it's the uh, uh, in the Weddell Sea, uh, another ice shelf of roughly equivalent size. Along the peninsula, these are the Larsen Ice Shelf, and there are other ice shelves uh, that <clears throat> are the, the spilling off of ice from the higher elevations. So this is what it looks like in action. Uh, this is the polar plateau in the background. Uh, these are the Transantarctic Mountains on either side, and these huge streams of ice are, are spilling off. And eventually, they reach the sea, and they just keep spilling off into the sea. Uh, this is a picture of what it looks like. This is actually not from Antarctica, but this is uh, from Greenland, and it's a scale that you can actually see the, the pancake batter uh, spilling off and, and forming a floating ice shelf. Well, these ice shelves, these floating ice shelves, uh, are beginning to destabilize as the ocean water uh, underneath them is warming. And so they are thinning from below, not so much from above, but they're thinning from below and uh, are becoming susceptible uh, to break up. And so all, along the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, this Larsen ice shelf uh, has uh, already uh, suffered loss. The most recent uh, breakup was in March of 2002, and the Wilkins ice shelf over here uh, there was a breakup in 2009. And this is the Larsen Ice Shelf. And in a period of only five weeks, uh, an area the size of the state of Rhode Island uh, broke out and delivered a huge amount of uh, fragmented ice into, uh, ultimately into the Circumantarctic Current where it was eventually melted. The Wilkins Ice Shelf in 2008, and eventually breaking, uh, losing these big fragments uh, in 2009, uh, shown here. And then on the, one of the big glaciers coming off of uh, West Antarctica, the Pine Island Glacier, uh, here is a, a picture of a fragment that broke off a few years back. Uh, that's 25 miles uh, in dimension. And just recently, a new crack is forming back here. Another piece that large uh, is imminent. Now, this is big ice. This, this is not sea ice. This is not three or five feet thick. This is big ice. And for scale, we have a research vessel here, the RV Roger Ravel from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in California. And this is a, a piece of the uh, ice shelf, and you have to remember that this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the, the big part of it is, is, is below. Well, does it, any of this matter? Well, you bet it does, because when you have ice 
coming from the continents and going to the sea, that ice raises sea level. When you drop an ice cube into a beverage glass, the water goes up instantaneously when you put that ice cube in it. And as more and more ice spills off of both Greenland and Antarctica, uh, we are seeing a rise in sea level. This is a record of sea level from tide gauges around the world uh, over the basically the 20th century. And there's lots of variability, as you can see, uh, depending on an individual tide gauge. But the, the average of this is up, up, up. And since about 1979, we've had satellite measurements of sea level that simply bounce beams from the satellite down to the sea and measure the time it takes to come back. And that record overlaps with the tide gauge record, giving us confidence in both. This has been about 20 centimeters, or eight inches, of sea level rise in the 20th century. But that's accelerating. And the projections, now this is a graph over two centuries, the 19th century, uh, I mean the 20th century, and now into the 21st century. Uh, here's the record I just showed you. Uh, this is the uh, 20 centimeter, eight inch rise over the 20th century. And we're seeing an acceleration even at the end of that. And the projections that you see here are different scenarios about how the 21st century will unfold in terms of sea level rise. Now, the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fifth assessment report, which just came out a few months ago, its projections of sea level, which have always been conservative, largely fall in this gray shaded area here. Uh, and it ranges from, uh, this is in inches above sea level at roughly the turn of the century, and uh, something like 20 to more than 40 inches of sea level rise are the, is the range that the IPCC is uh, projecting. But I should say that the IPCC has historically been extremely conservative and that sea level rise has always been at, either at the upper limit or outpaced what the IPCC projections have been. And so my personal guess is that we're much, going to be following much closer uh, to the upper part of that range, which means by the end of the century, something on the order of you know, three feet of sea level rise. And I know you all know what three feet is, but it's roughly up to my belt. And uh, anyone who is on the coast will certainly notice three feet of sea level rise. People around the world are already noticing sea level rise. Uh, people who live in small island nations in the Pacific, uh, Kiribati, uh, Tuvalu, uh, are already seeing rising sea level introducing salt water into their freshwater reservoirs their groundwater reservoirs. Uh, people are looking for refugee status uh, in uh, other countries. In the Maldives, uh, islands in the uh, Indian Ocean, this is the capital city of the Maldives. It's not a, a nation that is a, a third, uh, third world nation. It's a, a prosperous nation, but it has the distinction that no part of the Maldives is more than seven feet above sea level. And already the government of the Maldives has been to India and Pakistan to talk about buying property uh, for climate refugees. Now you don't have to go to the far reaches of the globe to see what sea level rise would mean. We can talk about the USA. Here uh, you can see southeastern USA, uh, Florida, and the Gulf Coast. Here's Louisiana. And everything in red is what would be uh, inundated by a one meter or three foot rise of sea level. And every, all of the coastal beaches along the Atlantic, the Everglades, uh, the coastal beaches along the uh, Gulf Coast, and much of the uh, Mississippi River Delta uh, would be inundated uh, with three feet of sea level rise. And on the west coast, here's a picture of San Francisco Bay. Here's the Golden Gate, 
right here. This is the bay. And the red shows the inundation. And it's not surprising that the areas around the bay would be inundated, but the Sacramento River, which goes almost all the way to Sacramento, is vulnerable to one meter of sea level rise as well. And the white on the, this graph represents population density. So we're talking about lots of people that are affected by even a one meter rise in sea level. Worldwide, a one meter rise in sea level will displace 100 million people. Now, you recall that in the USA, we experienced a displacement of 150,000 people with Hurricane Katrina and the evacuation of the city of New Orleans. And although it was a challenge uh, and we did our very best, it wasn't a, a stellar performance of dealing with refugees from that flooding. That was 150,000 people. Three feet of sea level rise is 100 million people. All right, here I offer ancient advice. <laughs> so I, I asked the question, where are we headed? What, what, what is the future going to look like? And the best evidence we have is the recent past because it reflects what we've been doing. And here is the recent past in terms of the concentration of the greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, the heat trapping gas in the atmosphere since 1957 when this measurement series began. So it runs from 1957 up to the present day. And uh, it started at about 315 parts per million and it reached 400 just this year. And the obvious thing here is that it's going up. That's where we're headed. Uh, we're increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But I want to give you some longer perspective on what this level of greenhouse gas concentrations really means in an historical context. Yesterday, we heard about ice cores and their reconstruction of climate from Greenland and Antarctica. And uh, the Antarctic record goes back 800,000 years now. I've shown only 400,000 years here. So here's the present day, 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, all the way back to 400,000. And what we're looking at is the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere at those times as revealed by little bubbles of atmosphere that were trapped in ice. And the important lesson here is that while there's ups and downs, the entire range of natural variability, the carbon dioxide never exceeded about 280 parts per million. And at the low end, it was about 180 parts per million. That shaded area represents nature's own natural fluctuations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The red line, if you recall, I said that that previous graph, it began at 315 parts per million. That was right here. And today we're up at uh, near 400. And so what is clear from this is that we are way outside the range of what nature has been doing. And if we don't change direction, the red line tells us where we're headed. And so uh, I call this the big inadvertent human experiment with Earth's climate. When we started burning fossil fuels, coal, well, even wood, for that matter, would not fossil fuel, but then coal and then oil and then um, uh, natural gas, uh, we didn't say, well, we know we're damaging the environment, but, you know, who cares? Uh, energy was a big, a big factor in our, our well-being, in our raising the standard of our living and such. Little did we realize that we were conducting an inadvertent experiment with our climate because we were sending the carbon dioxide, the waste product, into the atmosphere.
And so this indicates, as I say, it gives you a context for the, uh, what these current levels uh, amount to. Now, if we take a look at the future, uh, here is a graph of the 21st century running from 2000 out to 2100. And this is carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And here's where we are today, uh, right at 400. Now, what the future holds, it depends on what we do. These are choices that, that we make. Uh, if we choose to keep using uh, fossil fuels at an accelerating pace, uh, we'll reach uh, close to 900 parts per million by the end of the century. If we uh, begin to use both non-fossil and fossil fuels in increasing proportions, we'll reach 700 parts per million. And if we have a more rapid conversion to the cleaner and more resource efficient energy technologies, we might uh, not go any higher than about 500 parts per million. Every one of these scenarios shows a continued increase, but they're at a different pace. And so uh, the, the choices are how, what kinds of policies might lead us to follow this blue path as opposed to the red or even the yellow. So uh, the, I'm going to take just a few minutes because you know, when I talk about the science of climate change, I have some credibility because I'm a scientist and I've engaged in this stuff. When I talk about policy, I'm just another citizen. Uh, policy is not strictly science. It involves you know, uh, economics and politics and um, population growth and things like that. A lot of factors that I, I certainly have no expertise in. But I think that if I had to choose what, what would make up a climate change policy that had a chance of, of letting us change direction substantially. Uh, the first is psychological. We should stop pretending that it's not happening. Uh, there are still people who deny climate change or deny that humans are playing a role in it or deny that it'll be a serious uh, consequence. You have to get beyond that. Uh, climate change is happening. Humans are the cause, the principal cause of it uh, currently, and our humans have actually taken control of the climate system since about the mid 20th century, although we certainly didn't know it at the time. Uh, we have to level the playing field between the carbon-based fuels and the non-carbon-based fuels. Now, currently the carbon-based fuels are subsidized. Now, you might say, well, what are the, what are the subsidies of the carbon-based fuels? I, I didn't know that we were subsidizing it. Well, we are subsidizing the carbon-based fuels by letting them use the atmosphere as an open sewer. You can pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and pay no, no penalty for it. We don't, let, we don't let people do that to our shoreline, to our lakes, to our rivers. Those, those policies were established a century ago to eliminate direct pollution of our surface waters. But currently, uh, the carbon-based uh, energy can use the atmosphere without paying for it. So I think that that has to, to end. Uh, and I, I noted in, in the newspaper just this week that 20 large corporations said that their advanced planning, their financial planning, assumes that there will be a carbon tax or some other way in which uh, you begin to uh, level the playing field. They just uh, are no longer arguing about it. They uh, say that it will uh, it will happen. The last one uh, is don't think that somehow technology is going to rescue us. Uh, the, there is no silver bullet. Uh, we need lots of things happening. Uh, we need every horse in the stable pulling. And uh, we can't just pray that, oh, there's going to be a, an amazing technology breakthrough that will make, make this painless. So what are the things that are we can be doing. Uh, the first is to quit wasting energy. Uh, the, the, the cheapest energy you'll ever find is the energy you don't use. You don't pay anything for it. And we waste a lot of energy. And, and uh, companies, the municipalities, who, anyone who's carefully examined their energy usage has discovered 
you can save a lot of money just by quitting uh, the wasteful practice. That's the low-hanging fruit, and lots of peoples and municipalities are engaged in that. There's alternative energy development. This is the development of wind and solar and geothermal and wave energy and the like. And it's uh, uh, certainly not dominant uh, in terms of our overall energy supply, but it's growing very, very rapidly. There is the recognition that if we continue to use carbon-based fuels, that can we somehow capture the carbon dioxide and not let it go to the atmosphere? That's what carbon capture and, and sequestration uh, means. Uh, it's an interesting idea, but so far it's not been economically uh, attainable. Uh, the processes that have been developed in pilot plants are not uh, uh, economically uh, uh, feasible. One can talk about uh, slowing population growth. Uh, every, every person who's born wants to eat and wants to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer if possible. And then we have to lastly face up to the fact that changes are already here. Sea level is rising. The oceans are getting warmer. The oceans are getting more acidic. The atmosphere is changing composition. Agriculture is changing. And we have to adapt to those changes uh, because they're already with us. And uh, that has to be a part of uh, the policy for the future. Now, there is some good news. Uh, for a long time, I didn't have much in the list of good news. But the, here's a, a map showing proposed new US coal plants that had been put on the drawing boards in this interval of time. And since then, that many have been canceled. And, and why have they been canceled? Well, in part because energy conservation has slowed the need for more energy growth. But more importantly, natural gas turns out to be a lot cheaper fuel than coal does these days. And so why would you build a coal plant when you can fuel it by natural gas? And that's played a big role in the cancellation of so many uh, coal plants. Now, the in 2012, uh, new USA generating capacity included increasingly significant amounts of renewable resources with wind surpassing natural gas. So here's the, the graph that shows the new energy uh, capacity in 2012. There was more new energy capacity added by wind than by natural gas shown in the orange. And the others are, are smaller yet. But the mere fact that wind energy has overtaken even natural gas as the newest source of energy is, to me, a, a very uh, promising step. So that brings me to my last slide. I know you've all been very patient. The Chinese word for crisis is actually two words, two symbols. The one on the left means danger, and the one on the right means opportunity. And that is all embodied in the Chinese meaning of crisis. Now, I've talked a lot about the danger. You know, the sea level is going to rise, and we're going to lose water supplies from mountain glaciers and the like. But I don't want to leave you with only the idea that this is a catastrophe in the making, because there's lots of opportunity that I think is significant. The opportunity is in the form of which nation, which industry is going to be the industry that sets the stage for a new industrial economy of the 21st century. The 20th century was an industrial economy built on the fossil fuels. But it doesn't mean that you know, we have to wait until the fossil fuels are gone before we do move on to something else. I always like to say that you know, people didn't 
We, we left the Stone Age long before we ran out of stones. <laughs> the, 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 there are better ways to do things, and once you recognize it, then the opportunity is there to make the better way replace the less, lesser appealing way. And I think that's where we are, uh, that there's a tremendous opportunity to, to be the uh, industrial leaders of the globe, um, and, and it will come in providing the alternative energy that replaces the, the fossil fuels. Now in 2010, investments in renewable energies exceeded investment in fossil fuels for the very first time. And that, that's encouraging. Uh, I think we're in the middle of a transition that will accelerate and lead to changes that are far faster than were projected even a decade ago. So I want to leave you with that idea that this is not all, you know, gloom and doom, uh, because there is, we can avoid the very worst effects of climate change, and at the same time, uh, remake the modern industrial world in ways that will be far less damaging to the environment than the continued burning of the fossil fuels. So, I want to thank you all for coming, and I greatly appreciate the excellent turnout. Uh, I know I've held you far longer than I should have, uh, but I, I do appreciate the fact that you came out uh, to uh, hear about ICE and why it matters, and uh, I look forward to conversations with you uh, after uh, we terminate the formal program. Thank you. So Dr. Pollack has agreed to take some of your questions from the floor. We do have a microphone on both levels, and this is being recorded by BTV10 from the city of Bellingham, so you will be able to see this. Uh, check their website for its airing time and also the online, online video on demand. I would ask that you raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll make sure that your question is heard on the recording. I have a question I'm dying to ask. What is the current theories on the fresh water entering the conveyor belt there in the Atlantic and the possibility that that conveyor belt slows or stops and we actually end up having a new ice age occur? So the, the question had, has to do with uh, are there consequences of climate change that are potentially able to change the circulation of the principal ocean currents on the Earth. Now the ocean currents transport heat. For instance, the Gulf Stream gathers heat in the equatorial region and carries it up to the Arctic polar region. And it's that extra heat that is carried that makes Western Europe habitable. If that were not there, Western Europe is at the same latitude as Hudson's Bay and uh, it would have a climate like Hudson's Bay without the Gulf Stream. Uh, the fact that even far north of the Arctic Circle, for instance, the Russian port of Murmansk is an ice-free port year-round, even though it's well north of the Arctic Circle. And why is that? Because the Gulf Stream sends warm water into the Arctic Ocean. So are there things that are, we're doing now, or consequences of things we're doing that could alter that circulation and potentially slow it or even turn it off? Well, the answer is yes, uh, because what drives that circulation is the fact that you have warm water going north at the surface and it gradually cools off. It sinks in the Arctic Ocean and then travels south along the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean in a long belt, a long conveyor belt. And what makes it uh, sink in the Arctic is that it gradually becomes saltier and colder, both of which give water increased density, and when you make it dense enough, it sinks. And so you get this overturning, uh, the sinking in the Arctic, due to the fact that the water is uh, getting chilled and it's getting salty. Well, if you alter those two factors by making it warmer, so that it's more buoyant. And if you make it fresher by sending meltwater from the permafrost regions into the Arctic Ocean, 
might you reach a point where it wouldn't sink or it would sink more slowly. And that would lead to either a total shutdown or a, uh, a slowing. There's, people are very aware of this, this issue and lots of calculations have been made and lots of observations have been made. The observations don't show any long-term slowing at all. Uh, at various times it might slow for a year or and then pick up again. Uh, in various places on the bottom where they've measured currents, it shows some variability. But there's no long-term trend to the speed of the Gulf Stream current. And the model projections, the calculations well into the future, suggest that it probably wouldn't happen for many hundreds of years, maybe thousands. And so that's another piece of good news, is that this large-scale regulation or redistribution of heat around the globe doesn't seem to be slowing down yet. And so it's a long answer to the, your straight question, but I wanted to give some context to it. Professor, your, your thoughts please on using laser-induced fusion, magnetic fusion, or, or conventional nuclear energy as forms of uh, power, alternative energy please. Certainly, uh, a nuclear energy is one that already plays a role. In the U.S., it uh, makes up about a fifth of our total energy production. And in France, it makes up more than 80%, although 80% of what France uses is less than 20% of what we use. So the U.S. is still the largest producer of nuclear energy uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, I personally am not opposed to nuclear energy, but uh, currently, the economics uh, are not, in all, not at all in its favor. Uh, the cost of building a new nuclear plant of designs that already exist uh, just is an investment that the utility companies won't make. Uh, we've not had a new nuclear plant started in the USA for more than well, almost 40 years until last year uh, two new plants were started. Uh, but the cost is very, very high. and so. I think the economics uh, will be the impediment there, uh, although as I say scientifically, I, I personally uh, am not opposed to nuclear energy. I said earlier that we need every horse in the stable pulling, and I think nuclear energy is a, a horse that's in the stable right now. As for fusion energy, uh, we have been making a big investment in fusion energy uh, for a long, long time. And as the, uh, there's a saying that uh, we're always within five years of success. <laughs> but so far, that has not uh, worked out. Thank you. you talked a lot about, uh, up here on the top, you talked a lot about um, the effect of CO2 on climates and the predictions for what that's going to be. Can you comment on the uh, effects of the release of methane from methane hydrates and from um, permafrost? Sure, as well. sure. Uh, CO2 is the, the principal greenhouse gas, the heat trapping gas, that uh, is uh, the big player in the atmosphere. But there are other gases, and, and methane is one of them. Uh, methane is what we call natural gas. Methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Uh, it, uh, but its saving grace is that it's much uh, shorter lived in the atmosphere. It only has a residence time in the atmosphere of about 12 years, whereas carbon dioxide is more like two centuries or more. And so um, there are, uh, me methane, uh, because of its shorter life, uh, some people say, well, maybe a, uh, that's not so harsh. But what is the bigger worry, and was the, behind the question, is that there's a lot of methane locked up in permafrost and in a, a form of ice beneath the seafloor called a methane hydrate. And both the permafrost and the methane hydrates in the seafloor are susceptible to destabilization in the, in the former case as the atmosphere warms, and in the latter case as the seawater warms. And the amount of methane that's contained in the hydrates and in the permafrost is huge. 
And if all of that were to be escaping to the atmosphere in short time period, it would greatly outpace carbon dioxide and lead to probably runaway warming. Now there's been a lot of measurement of how much methane is leaving the permafrost and how much is escaping from the methane hydrates on the seafloor. And indeed, there is escape from both. But what is missing in the story is what was it like 50 years ago? In other words, is it changing or are we just seeing the natural background loss that maybe have been going on uh, for long periods of time? But the measurement programs are getting uh, longer in duration and we're getting a better feeling as to whether that loss is accelerating. Uh, the, in terms of the permafrost, it probably is accelerating. In terms of the seafloor hydrates, I, I think the question is still out. But uh, it's, it's definitely a feedback in the Arctic, the thawing of the permafrost and the release of the methane. The, the methane itself then ac accelerates the climate change that's causing the methane or the softening of the permafrost to begin with. So it's worrisome. Uh, and I'm glad you asked the question. It's a, uh, something that we, we hope uh, stays at a slow enough pace that our other uh, activities will uh, be able to absorb that. But it's not, it's not clear. It's, it's part of the urgency of getting on with it and avoiding denial. Uh, a 20 year head start on many of these new technologies would, would have meant a lot had we done it in you know, 1980 or 1990 but we've been you know, treading water or going backwards uh, for various reasons. Um, I know this isn't in your purview of science, but as far as um, the global implications and the nations that are emerging now, China, India, South America with economies, um, wouldn't they say we have a colonial mentality, we had our chance, so now they want to um, <clears throat> develop, and in fact, the coal that is in Montana and is an issue here in Bellingham is wants to, China needs it to be shipped there so they can continue their industrial development. Uh, what kind of a consensus or, or a plan would there be for getting the world on board? It's a good question. People often ask, you know, well, why should the USA or Europe uh, do something if the rest of the world isn't going to uh, help with this issue. And, uh, and I always answer that it's, it's better to have a reduction of 20% than none. And, and there are big, big things that happen with even a 20% reduction in emissions. But the, uh, the issue of China in particular and its uh, huge growth of its uh, industrial economy which is not based entirely on coal. Uh, China is also one of the leading producers of wind power and of uh, photoelectric power. Uh, China, in my estimation, will abandon coal much sooner than you think. And why is that? Because the environmental effects of burning coal are so severe and the public health effects are so severe I, some of you may have seen television just this week with the city of Shanghai uh, all wearing, you know, surgical uh, filters. It's, uh, the people of China will not take it, I can assure you. <laughs> and uh, they will recognize that they are being asked to pay the price for industrialization, not so much in climate change, I'm not sure that they appreciate that, but in their own daily health problems uh, and I think that that will lead to an acceleration of the non-carbon based fuels in China. So I'm, I'm actually sanguine that China will come around far faster than we imagine. Uh, they're painted as being, you know, oh, a new coal fired plant uh, every day for the next hundred years or so. I, I'm exaggerating, of course. But uh, they are building new coal fired plants, but the, the uh, benefits of coal-fired plants today compared to what they were 30 and 40 years ago, which is the cause of a lot of their pollution today, uh, that alone is a big step in, in, uh, in cutting back on carbon emissions. I mean, there are better technologies uh, for coal-fired 
electrical generation. But I, I'm still confident that uh, coal is, is on the decline worldwide and uh, that uh, it's just like stones, we're going to leave a lot of coal behind uh, and we don't, we don't need it and the faster we develop alternatives, uh, the better and both natural gas and wind uh, far exceeded uh, new generating capacity by coal in our country last year. So I, I think it, it's, we're, we're riding a, a wave of uh, transition. Can you comment on the effect of climate change on weather, particularly in light of the major okay. events that have happened this year? Yeah. The, the effects of climate change on weather. Well, there's an old saying that, uh, first I should say, climate is the long-term average of weather. That's uh, an, an, an old saying that says, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And it's true uh, because, you know, everything varies, you know, above or below average. But the, the real question is, uh, are we seeing the kind of the probability distribution of severe events shifting over time? And so something that was, a, let us say, a hundred year flood uh, in the mid 20th century is now a 10 year flood uh, today. Uh, they're occurring much more frequently. Or the same with uh, intensive rainfall events, such as hit Boulder, Colorado, or Calgary, Alberta, or the island of uh, uh, Sardinia, which uh, a couple of weeks ago got 17 inches of rainfall in one day, and that's half of their entire annual typical rainfall. Those kinds of events are, uh, in my mind, a direct consequence of the warming of the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere, when it's warmer, can hold more water vapor. And that means that you can evaporate more, you can precipitate more, and it, it doesn't sit in the atmosphere forever. It sits, the typical residence time of water vapor in the atmosphere is two weeks. And so we're looking at a fast uh, turnaround. And uh, the fact that for every degree of warming of the atmosphere, you can have 7% more water vapor, that's plain physics. Uh, that, to me, is what is, is driving uh, the increased frequency of these both severe precipitation events, but also the severe drought effects as well, that we're, we're uh, pulling more soil moisture out of the soil. So uh, people, sometimes you'll hear, well, you can't attribute any single event to climate change. Maybe true, maybe not. But I use the analogy, uh, if you take a look at the home run records in the Major League Baseball, uh, they, of course, long eclipsed Babe Ruth. But now we're learning that you know, some of the players were on steroids. Well, do steroids cause you to hit more home runs? Can you attribute? you know, home run number 64 to steroids? No, you can't really, but it creates an environment in which you're, over a whole season, you're likely to hit more home runs. And that's what I, kind of the analogy I draw with the warming of the atmosphere and the increased water vapor, is that any single storm I'm not going to argue for, but the fact that we're seeing them more and more frequently and with greater intensity, I, I think is because the environment has changed just as you can likely hit more home runs if you're on steroids than if not. And so uh, I think that increased weather severity is indeed a, a consequence of the warming of the atmosphere. You've uh, been to some of these places where the seas are rising, no doubt, and seeing the suffering that's going on, people that are on the front lines of, of, of climate change. I'm, and I'm just wondering, in terms of the questions that are out there now in terms of climate responsibility, whether or not you would foresee that some of the shift that you were saying was a, a, a source of hope, which would be like ending carbon subsidies, whether one thing might be done to tip the balance or to rectify the 
the consequences that are being suffered by people who's, who are not responsible for much of what, what's happening to them might be to actually shift some of that technology, the, the, the independent kinds of solar technologies for them as part of the global deal to say we're all in this together. I, I think that uh, your suggestion is uh, more or less included in my last slide that's called opportunity. I, I think that you know, developing a technology and making it available uh, around the globe is an opportunity. And uh, so I'm all in favor of it. Uh, the, there's lots of, many parts of the world that do want to have higher standards of living, many parts of the world that want to develop. Uh, and if we can provide technology that will let them do it in ways that are, are less harmful to the environment and, and less uh, provocative of, of rising sea levels and such, the better. So that's what I call the opportunity. It's not a penalty that we do this. Uh, it's not a penalty that we give up the fossil fuels. It's an opportunity to leave them behind and, and to move on to the, the, new, uh, the new industrial economy of the 21st century. Please, let's give Henry a great big round of applause.